Bibles, please. We're going to turn to the book of Jude. I think we'll be in this book one more night. Well, tonight and one more after this, I should say. It's a small book, but a very powerful book, of course. And uh, by the way, today is the last day officially of summer. Fall starts tomorrow. How many of you enjoy fall? I love fall. It's one of my favorite seasons. It cools down. The colors change. I just, I really do enjoy it. I like pumpkin everything. I like caramel everything. And all, all that's just a really good, a really good mix in the fall. So, uh, I've, I've learned to enjoy every season of life, but I'm really looking forward to fall uh, beginning tomorrow. Uh, the book of Jude, we've uh, gone most of the way through the book at this point, or about halfway, I should say. Uh, let's go to uh, notice verse 3 again. It's the key verse in the whole book. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Again, the only reason it's common is not because of the price that was paid. That was uncommon. The blood of the Son of God. It's common because we're all saved the same way. We're all saved by grace through faith. He said, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. He said, I would have loved to just given the gospel, but I'm telling you, you need to contend for the faith. You need to contend for that body of truth. Why? Verse 4, because there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And what are some of the earmarks of these false teachers, false preachers. Verse 5, they're unbelievers, and they're just like the people who came out of Egypt who were delivered from Egypt but did not believe, and they were destroyed. They're like the angels in verse 6 who were rebellious against God. They're like Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7 who gave themselves over to fornication. They are filthy dreamers like the prophets in Jeremiah's day that instead of preaching the word of God were preaching visions out of their own heart. They despised the dominion. They wanted no authority outside of themselves, and yea, even they would speak against uh, all authority outside of themselves. And verse 10, what do they know? What they do know are the matters of the flesh. They know those things which come naturally, those matters of the senses. In verse 11, there is a warning, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. What was Cain's sin? It was pride, thinking he could come to God any way he wanted to. Uh, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. What was Balaam's fault? He was looking for possessions, not the will of God, not God's holiness, not God's righteousness. Materialism motivated Balaam to do what he did. And, verse 11, perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Cori Korah wanted power. He was not happy with what God had given him. He wanted more, very much like Satan. And this is where we left off, verse 12 uh, let's begin here, verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Lord, please speak to our hearts tonight again as we come to your word. We know that all scripture is given by your inspiration and is profitable to us. So Lord, we ask you tonight that that will be profitable to our hearts, that will yield to you whatever you showed to us. Lord, may you be honored and glorified now. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, verse 12, notice what he says. They are twice dead. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, if you would, please. And, of course, we're going to turn back and forth from Jude to some other books. Uh, Curtis Hudson used to say this. If you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice... You'll only die once. And actually, the way Jesus said it is, if you're born again, you'll never die. Because, yes, your body uh, lays down here, but you step immediately into eternity with the Lord. But notice Ephesians 2. Before we're saved, we are literally dead in our trespasses and sins. And by the way, this is why lordship salvation is a false doctrine. A person who is lost cannot show evidence of salvation before they're saved. They cannot. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. Uh, many times, and I want to preach on this sometime soon, we mix up evidences of salvation for uh, requirements for salvation. Folks, there's only one requirement for salvation. What is it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus did the hard part for us. There's only one requirement for salvation. That's it. But now there are evidences of salvation. There are evidences, 
And one of those evidences, yes, is your desires change, your want to changes. You still have an old nature, but you have a new nature fighting the old nature. But notice before we're saved, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, You hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit, that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. Notice that word, nature. By nature we are the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. What's grace? It's God's undeserved favor and kindness towards me as a sinner. How can I be saved? By grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. There's no price we can pay. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. It's a free gift. We're saved by grace through faith, verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. We had no works. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. But now notice verse 10. Once you are saved, there is an evidence of salvation. Remember, God, it's God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So because we're not saved by our works at all. We're saved by Jesus' finished work. But because we are saved, the Holy Ghost of God is working in us to produce good works through us. Notice, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. But what he's saying about these false prophets in verse 12 of Jude, he's saying they're twice dead. These, they're not born again. Don't mistake these verses and think, uh, as some do, that, hey, they were saved and now they're lost. No, they've never been saved. They're twice dead. They're plucked up by the roots. And then notice back in Jude, verse 13, he says, They're raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jesus talked about those who would be cast into outer darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And these folks are twice dead. They're, they're headed for hell. They're lost. And they're leading others to hell. Uh, notice, go to Isaiah 57. He mentions some folks very much like this uh, picture he's just given. Isaiah 57. Notice verse 20 and 21. He says, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. You, you know, if people are trying to work their way to heaven, there is no rest. Isn't it wonderful to be able to just rest in Jesus? I'm resting in his righteousness. I'm resting in his finished work. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Go back to Jude and notice what he says in verse, uh, verse 13 again. He says that to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. This is the opposite of what... Our reservation is. What is our reservation as born-again believers? We'll look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Our reservation, notice verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, notice, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. These false prophets have a reservation, but their reservation is in hell. Those who are saved, the reservation is in heaven. And he's, again, warning these believers about these false prophets who are leading others to hell. Folks, again, there are very strong words. God has very strong words for spiritual leadership or so-called spiritual leadership who are leading others to hell. Remember what Paul said in Galatians. He said, those who are leading others to hell, I wish they were accursed. What does that mean? It means literally damned to hell. 
Say, boy, that, that's not loving. No, it's absolutely loving. If one person is leading hordes of people to hell, it'd be better for them to go on than to continue to lead hordes of people to hell. And right here, he's saying these false prophets, to them, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now look at verse 14. It says, and Enoch also. And by the way, here is another, another example of something that we would not have known without the book of Jude. But notice it says, Enoch also. Now, how many of you remember Enoch? What happened with Enoch? He was translated. He was not, for the Lord took him. He was walking with God, and you've heard it said that way, I'm sure. One day God said, Enoch, my house is closer than yours. Just come on home with me. And that's exactly what happened. Enoch went on home. He, he was translated. He didn't die. What a, an amazing thing. Uh, just like Elijah. Elijah didn't die. Uh, but here Enoch, notice he was a preacher of righteousness. Notice verse 14. It says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. So all the way back in Genesis, the end times are being preached about. Jesus Christ returned before he'd even come the first time is being preached about. Notice, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice what Enoch said. He said he's coming back with tens, ten thousands of his saints. Folks, we're coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ. When he returns to the earth, he's coming the first time in the clouds. We're going to meet him in the air. There'll be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, God's wrath is being poured out on this earth. But then we are returning with him to this earth where he literally sets up his kingdom for a thousand years. And how is his kingdom going to be ruled? Go to Revelation. Let's just remember this again. Look at Revelation 19. Remember that at that point, when Jesus sets up his kingdom, there are still lost people. There are still people with hearts of rebellion against God in this world. As a matter of fact, the proof of that is, at the end of that thousand years, Satan is going to be released for one last hurrah. And he's going to go around deceiving the nations one more time. We don't know how long. It just says for a short time, a short season. He's going to gather people together against Christ. Even after a thousand years of perfect reign, he's going to gather folks against Christ. But when Christ rules and reigns, how will he rule and reign? Notice Revelation 19, verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven open." And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He came the first time to suffer on a cross. He's coming again to the earth to make war, to set up a kingdom. Notice verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a what? What does it say? A rod of iron. That means he's going to rule with judgment. There are people who are not going to want to bow to Jesus Christ, who are not going to want to follow his law, but he's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to make sure his law is followed. Notice, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Don't forget that we rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Go back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, notice verse 26. Folks, when Jesus comes, it won't be a democracy. It won't be even a constitutional republic. Uh, his law won't be on the ballot box. It's going to be his way, period. That's how it's going to be. In Revelation 2, notice verse 26. It says, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. When we rule and reign with Christ, we will rule with a rod of iron under Christ's leadership. And so again, if you read the Psalms, in fact, let's go there. We have time. Go to Psalm 2. It's amazing. Every dictator, every president, every king, uh, every boss is going to bow to the Lord, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. But they have in their minds this imagination that they're going to break free from him, that they're not going to do what he says, that they're going to still have things their way. And notice Psalm 2, it's speaking of this. It says, Why do the heathen rage? 
And the people imagine a vain thing. What's the thing, the vain thing they're imagining? They're imagining life without God. They're imagining, there, there's even a song written by some hippie about imagine life without God. Uh, there, there's, they're imagining life without any restraint. They're imagining life without anybody telling them what to do. And he, they're imagining this vain thing. Notice verse 2. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This is Who is this talking about? Jesus Christ. Verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a, what are the next three words? With a what? rod of iron thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel be wise now therefore O ye kings be instructed ye judges of the earth serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him I've put my trust in him how about you I have praise God I'm glad I'm on his side He's coming to take over, folks. He's not coming. This won't be on a ballot. He won't ask. He won't put out a public opinion poll and say, what do you think about my word? What do you think about my law? It's going to be his way. Go back to Jude, if you would. Notice Jude, Enoch, preached about that. He preached. He said, listen, uh, the Lord cometh, verse 14, with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice verse 16, again, more characteristics of these false, uh, these false teachers. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They're always murmuring. They're always complaining. They're doing what their lusts tell them to do. And notice that last part. They have men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They admire mankind, not God. They're for sale. They'll do whatever people want them to do. They're living as unto man, not unto God. Folks, we need to live our lives to an audience of one. By the way, that is so freeing. It really is. It's a wonderful way to live, to just live your life to an audience of one. And who is that? That's God. Make sure God is pleased with your life. Uh, let, let God take care of all the other things. Make sure God is pleased with your life. Uh, look over at uh, 2 Peter again, if you would. I want to notice the similar passage here again in 2 Peter 2, describing these same folks. 2 Peter 2. Folks, again, these are not believers these are not people who were believers and lost their salvation. These are people whose nature has never been changed. I want you to notice this in 2 Peter 2. Again, very much similar wording to Jude. 2 Peter 2, notice verse 10. He's speaking of these same folks. He says, Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Again, they despise anything, any authority outside of themselves. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. 
These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. What is their appeal? Their appeal is always to the flesh. Their appeal is always to the comfort of the flesh, not to the spirit, not to yielding to the Holy Spirit. It's always to the flesh. Verse 19, while they promise them liberty, notice they do it all in the name of liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now don't think that means somebody saved and they lost their salvation. What this is saying is somebody who was never exposed to truth, never exposed to the gospel, and they get so close to the gospel they're never saved, and then they turn even further into sin and into the world, they would have been better off never hearing it in the first place. Why? Because their heart gets hardened. What happens when a person hardens their heart over and over? We see this with Pharaoh. What happened? He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. And then what happened? God hardened his heart. Notice Verse 21, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now notice verse 22, there's a big key to understanding this passage. It says, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I'll just focus on the sow, okay, for a minute. Uh, think of the sow. You pull the sow out of the hog pen. You, you take it over to the, to, the, to the faucet. You get out the scrub brush. You get out the Dawn dish soap. And you start scrubbing the hog, scrubbing the sow. And the sow squealing. You're getting all the mud off, all the grub off, all the nastiness off. Boy, you make that pink skin shine. You put a nice little bow on that sow. Guess what? It's still a sow. You can clean it up, still a sow. You can put a bow on it, still a sow. Its nature hasn't changed. So what happens when you let it go? It doesn't matter how clean you made it. It doesn't matter if, if you waxed its, its skin. If you made it look just beautiful, what would, what would that sow do? Go right back to the muck and the mire. Why? Because its nature has not changed. See, our old nature is corrupt. All of us still have an old nature. The difference between somebody who's born again and somebody who's not is we have a new nature. What's our new nature? The Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, can, can a Christian go off into sin? Absolutely. I want you to think of something. Now, don't think a Christian can go off into sin and be happy. They can't. You'll grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He'll grieve you. When you grieve him, he grieves you. But I want you to think of the, the prodigal son. The prodigal son wandered away from his father, right? He went to the hog pen. He ended up in the muck and the mire. He was so hungry that he would have eaten something out of that hog pen. But what happened in the hog pen? He came to himself. He said, servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. Here's what I'll do. I'll go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. What was the difference? The son didn't want to stay in the hog pen. You know what the hog wants? The hog always wants the hog pen. That's what the hog wants. But the son wants to be back at the father's house. You see, when you're truly born again, you're a child of God. There's something in you, Philippians 2, 13. It's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So again, can a Christian go off into sin? Yes, they can, but they will never be happy. They'll never be at home in the hog pen. Here, these people, their, their nature has never changed. It has never changed. Go back to Jude. Again, they are twice dead. And they are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They're just trying to impress man. They couldn't care less what God thinks. Verse 17, he says, but beloved, don't be surprised by this. And by the way, if that's true in his day, it's true in our day. But beloved... Remember ye the words which were spoken before. Don't, don't be shocked by this. It's nothing new. Remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk 
after their own ungodly lusts. Go to 2 Peter. Let's look at what some of the apostles said about those last times and the nature of people who hate the word of God. They, they, they may think they love God, but they love a God they've imagined in their own mind. They don't love the God of the Bible. They don't love the God and his word. Remember, Jesus said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. It's not just, hey, I love the name of Jesus. Do you love the Jesus of the word of God? Do you love his word? Notice 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 3. It says, knowing this, Peter said, that, f knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter warned about those last days, I should say these last days. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Notice verse 1. Paul warns Timothy. He says to Timothy, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. He said there are going to be people who are going to depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. I look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. And if this doesn't describe our day and age, I don't know what does. 2 Timothy 3 Look at verses 1 through 7. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 7. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, dangerous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Our, folks, our problem is not we don't love ourselves enough. That's not our problem. Our problem is by nature we're selfish. That's our problem. That men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. By the way, going back to proud, I walked into Kroger in Mount Washington this week, and they've got a pride, a pride flyer posted on their door. I mean, that garbage is everywhere you go now. Pride, rubbing it in God's face. Folks, people will not get by with that. Verse 3, without natural affection. It is not natural for a man to desire a man. It's not natural. It's not, it's not natural for a woman to desire a woman. It's not natural. It's not nature. I mean, there's sin. Yeah, we're all sinners. But there's some sins against nature. Again, I want to remind you, you've never gone in the woods and seen a, you know, two bear, two boy bears married. You've never seen that. Why? Because it's against nature. It's not natural. You don't see a couple girl squirrels in a nest together. Why? Because it's against nature. It's an abomination. By the way, it's against nature. For a mother to kill the baby in her own womb. That's against nature. God planted in every mother that desire, that love for your own child. And so when a mother takes those steps to murder the child in her own womb, something has happened very bad in the mind and in the heart. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, means no self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, well, hey, we, who, who do you think you are, Pastor? I'll tell you who I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But we serve a holy, righteous God. And his, he's not going to stoop his standards, his word for anybody. Verse 4, traitors, heady. I, I, I told you the man I met from Africa in Michigan, I gave out a gospel track at the gas station. And uh, he mentioned some of the things he had seen, some of the satanic, and I, I won't even get into that tonight, some of the things he had seen in Africa because here's what he said. I gave him the track. He said, he said, oh, yes. He said, I'm a Christian. He said, I know Jesus. He said, that's great. And he said, by the way, brother, he said, don't ever let anyone tell you the devil isn't real. I said, oh, no, I agree with you. Absolutely. He goes, no. He said, I've seen. He told me some things he'd seen in Africa. But then he, he made a comment that just astounded me. He said, but here in America, the devil works differently. He said, here in America, the devil uses books. He said, people think they're so wise, but they're foolish. And folks, if you reject this word, you are foolish. If you take any man's opinions and ideas over God, you're foolish. 
He said, men are so foolish. Satan uses books over here. Why? Because we want to be heady, high-minded. Well, I've got a PhD and this and this and this. If, if what you believe and teach doesn't agree with the Word of God, you've bought into a bunch of foolishness. Heady, high-minded. Now notice this. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Just wanting the next pleasure. Not even caring what God says. How do we show our love for God? We don't show our love for God through a feeling about God. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. But lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Verse 5, boy, this absolutely defines most quasi-spirituality today. Verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. What does that mean? Looking spiritual. But God really has no control over your life, no power in your life. I don't want God telling me what to do. I want to look spiritual. I want to look the part. I want to look religious. But I want to live life how I want to live life. That's verse 5. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For, but for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 9, they shall proceed no further. There is an end to all that. Jesus Christ will return and he will rule and reign with a rod of iron. Go back to the book of Jude again. Notice in Jude, he says, verse 17, Beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Now, verse 19, These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. And I think this is about as far as we're going to get tonight. And then next week we get into the positive stuff. What should we do in the midst of a culture like this? What should we do? Verse 19, though, notice they separate themselves. What is he talking about? Is he talking about biblical separation? No. Biblical separation is a Bible truth. We should be separate from the world. We're to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. So what is he talking about? Here's what he's talking about. People who cause divisions. Now, folks, again, people will look at a church like ours and say, Your church, you are contentious. You are cantankerous. You're always getting in a fight with somebody. Hold on. We haven't changed. Hear what I'm saying. We haven't changed. Our ancestors who came to this land, folks, they believed this was the Word of God. And they didn't think they needed a new one. Did you hear what I said? They didn't think they needed a new one. They didn't think they needed a new version of the month club. They didn't. This book, this book right here that I'm preaching tonight, that I'm holding my hands, they didn't come around and say, well, you know, that verse really doesn't belong there like the NIV has, like the NASV has, like the ESV has, where they've taken literally 15, 16 verses out. Folks, do those verses belong there or not? You go to the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16, and it says, you know, and, and they were, in fact, let's go there. We have time, right? We have plenty of time. Look at this, Mark 16. Look, look at this for a minute. You go to verse 8. What's happened? Jesus has been crucified. He's been buried in the tomb. Verse 8 says, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now just write in your Bible. No, really don't. But if you believed the other so-called translations of the Bible, right there you should put the end. The end. Because if you'll read most of those others, if they include the rest of the verses, 9 through 20, they'll say, these don't appear in the best manuscripts. You know what that does? Does that strengthen your faith in the Word of God, or does that cause you to doubt? You know, it's the lost world. Listen to me, folks, this is important. It's the lost world who says, if the Bible's the Word of God, why do all the Bibles read differently? Did you hear what I said? It's, it's lost people who ask me that. People who are not saved. Well, if, if the Bible's the Word of God, how come they don't read the same? Good question. 
I'll tell you why, if you want to get to the answer, because they are literally different books. They're literally from different sources. That's another sermon for another night. But they're literally from different sources. Say, Pastor, you're being contentious. No, I'm not. I'm standing right where our forefathers stood. I'm preaching what our forefathers preached. I didn't change. This book didn't change. Somebody changed. Somebody's separating themselves. Somebody's causing division. Um, God's Word makes it very clear. Salvation is by grace through faith. By grace through faith. Baptism does not save. God's Word is very clear that we are not saved of our works at all. Folks, I haven't changed. That's, that's been preached for centuries before us. What I'm saying is many of these things have changed because people are separating themselves. They're, they're causing division in the church. Anybody who walks in and says, that verse doesn't belong there, you need to cut that one out. Hey, this would be better said this. They're causing division. They're separating themselves. Notice next, sensual. Sensual, what does that mean? It means literally what it says. All they know are what the natural brute beast, as they talked about earlier, just what their senses tell them, their eyes, their ears, their taste, their touch. All the senses, that's what they know. They don't know spiritual things. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. So they separate themselves. They cause divisions. They're sensual. And notice above all here, notice what it says. Having not the Spirit. Having not the Spirit. Folks, God's Word is very clear. Romans 8 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You either are saved and the Holy Spirit of God is living inside of you. Or you are not saved and the Holy Spirit of God is not living inside of you. And these folks are not, they have not the Spirit. They're not even born again. This is nothing new. What should true believers do in days of heresy, apostasy, false doctrine, and perverse living? What should true believers do? We're going to get into that next week, but just notice it again quickly. He says, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. And we'll pick that up next week. We'll dig into verses 20 through the end next week. Let's bow our heads together, please. I have to be honest. I don't like to be contentious. I don't like to have to contend for the faith. I'd rather just be able to preach it and everybody agree with it. I'd rather just do the positive things God told Jeremiah to do, to build up, to plant. I'd rather not have to pluck down, to throw down. But folks, that's what we have to do sometimes. Earnestly contend for the faith. Not, look, there is absolute truth. There is. There's absolute truth. Either the book I have on this pulpit is the Word of God or it isn't. Either every word in here is from God or it's not. Either Jesus is the only way as He claimed to be or He isn't. There's absolute truth. We must be willing to contend, earnestly contend for the faith. Let me remind you Ephesians 6. But the devil is crafty, he's wily, and so the Lord tells us, to put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able, to, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're not to hide. And by the way, there's no armor for the back. We're not to retreat. We're to fight. We're to earnestly contend for the faith. Jesus said it this way. He said, occupy till I come. You know what that means? It means take over. It means go, go stand for my truth. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of my word. In an adulterous and sinful generation. No, stand for truth. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Let your light shine. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. My head's bowed, my eyes are closed. Who would say, dear Lord, give me the courage, the strength, the spiritual strength to stand for truth in a generation, a last day's generation. Give me that strength, Lord, to stand up for what's right. If that's you, would you lift your hand to the Lord? Just commit yourself to Him. Lord, bless Your Word to our hearts tonight. Thank You for Your faithful people here tonight. Put a hedge about us as we go our separate ways. Lord, give us the strength, the boldness, the courage to stand for You, to stand for Your Word. 
We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.